And we'll start with Job. Job asked, if a man dies, will he live again? And everyone has wondered at some point in their life, what happens when we die? Is there more to this life? Is there an afterlife? It's hard to believe because the resurrection story is not something that's easy to understand. We don't see people resurrecting, so it's hard to kind of put our hands around and our minds around. But it's important, and that's why Paul writes about it here in Second or First Corinthians. And so that's why he deals with the issue head on, because it's a hard to, it's a hard thing for people to grasp the empty tomb. A lot of times they may want to ignore it, they just don't want to deal with it, and we don't want to deal with death. I was happy in my life to go for a very long time without God, not dealing with it. But God has a way of invading our lives, doesn't he? Now, others have other reasons for not believing. Maybe they were hurt in the past. Some Christian hurt them personally. Broken relationships. Failed moral compass of some sort. And they may take in a, a path of attack. And provoke because they think now that they've experienced all there was to experience in Christianity so now they're gonna tell us why we're wrong for example especially around Easter you might have heard um, some people talk about this thing called Ishtar that Easter the Christian Easter um, day that we celebrate is actually from the pagan holiday Ishtar or the goddess Ishtar. And they say that Easter is our way of saying Ishtar. Well, that's actually not true. And they say that the Easter bunny and the eggs really represent the goddess Ishtar. And so they say that we're celebrating the pagan goddess every year by handing out little fertility eggs. <laughs> she was the Mesopotamian goddess of sex and fertility, they say. So it goes. Well, what they don't tell you is that Easter is not how you pronounce Ishtar. Ishtar was not the goddess of fertility and sex. She was a goddess of war and sex. So a little bit of truth sprinkled in makes the lie easier to swallow. And even in their own religion, they got their own mythology mixed up several times. It changed over the hundreds of years. And they really didn't know what they were worshiping by the end of it. But of course, that just goes on and on. Then you have those that deny that Jesus even died on the cross. And that's kind of where we're getting to today because some people don't believe that. There's a group called the Jesus Seminar. And they say that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross. He actually lived through it. And the disciples stole the body or some variation of that. He lived through the beatings and even somehow managed to escape the cave in a broken body. He left the, the, the bloody rags in the tomb, made a few appearances, and then was never saw again, seen again. But the, evidence, the medical evidence completely contradicts that. For example, and I was gonna say, also this week I was in a conversation and I wanna tell you a little bit about this. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, the conversation went, you have Easter, you have Palm Sunday. And so Palm Sunday, you celebrate the entry to Jerusalem, the triumphal entry of the king. And then on Easter, you have the resurrection. So where do you really talk about the crucifixion? I want that a little bit right here. So I'm not going to go through a whole lot, but just a couple of highlights here. Did you know, for example, that when Jesus um, sweat the blood, this was caused by a rare condition brought on by extreme mental stress. It was called hermatidrosis. And with the knowledge of what he was getting ready to go through, the public flogging, and the severe beating that was going to result from that in the crucifixion, this condition not only allowed the blood capillaries to open up in his pores, but it weakened the condition of his skin so that when the flogging came, his skin nearly just burst open. Did you also know that the severe, the severe flogging he took, which consisted of leather tails on a whip, they had metal balls, sewn into the end and sometimes they had pieces of broken skull with jagged edges to ensure that his skin wouldn't rip open. The severity of this would lead to huge gaping wounds. Eusebius in the third century writes about this. I'm not gonna go into, it's very graphic, but I'm not gonna say all of it. 
but basically he had many internal stuff, organs exposed. So this is what Jesus went through. And this would put Jesus in what's called a hypovolemic shock. And this, gonna, this, did, this did four things for Christ while he was going through this. Number one, the heart races, the pump blood is no longer there. Number two, the blood pressure drops, causing fainting or collapse. And we see that throughout the Gospels as he carried the cross. Number three, the kidneys stop creating urine to save on the blood that is there. And we all know what happens when your kidneys stop functioning. This is massive, massive blood loss. And in those days, they didn't have ways of introducing new blood into the system. You lost it, it's it. Number four, the body becomes very thirsty because of the, lo the blood loss, and he starts craving fluids. And we've all heard that he was on the cross saying, I thirst. And why am I going through all that? Because do you think someone could survive that? He wasn't even on the cross yet. This was just the beating. And then he got nailed up. I'm going to skip through that because it, it can get, it gets really nasty. But the pain that he suffered was it generated, they had to make up a new word because where they nailed him in his wrist crushed a nerve that was so severe, the pain, they didn't even have a word to describe the pain. And the word that they used to describe it meant, means out of the cross. And that's the word excruciating. Out of the cross. And you know that word. Again, I'm saying this so we know that no one could survive this. And that's all to get to the point that if he died, then who are we following? What caused the disciples to follow a dead king? That's the subject of today's message. Because we all know they died, right? But our first point is that he rose. And Paul says that. He starts off in verse 1 and verse 2, 1 Corinthians 15. And this is what we preach, that, that Christ died for our sins by the, according to the scriptures. In verse 2, that he resurrected also according to the scriptures. We, we're not going to go into the prophecy. We've talked a little bit about that in the, in the past few weeks. But look at verse 3 and 4. Now, just to let you know, we're going to skim through this whole chapter. We're going to kind of fly through it. We're going to get a big kind of overview. We're not going to land on a whole lot of points, but we're not going to detail down on stuff, but we are going to land a few times, and, and this is one of them. Verse 3, verse 4. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received. This is Paul talking. So he's telling you, I received the gospel message that you also received. That Christ died according to our sins, according to the scriptures, I'm sorry, and like we just said, and that he was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now it's not all just about facts with Paul. Paul is a very factual guy. But notice this. In verse 5, he talks about Peter. Now what was the last thing that was going on with Peter when Jesus was being crucified? Last thing we see of Peter was he denied Christ three times. So this isn't just about facts. And we know that, the, that Jesus appeared to the women but in that, that culture, the women weren't eligible to testify about things. So that's why they didn't believe her or believe the women. But notice, Christ appeared to Peter. He, this is compassion. The last time we see Peter, he's denying, he's denying Christ three times. And the last time he even cusses to prove it. And we've done that to prove a point. We say something with emphasis and we might even throw a, a swear word in just to, to nail it down. And that's what Peter did. So he's got to know, and you, we got to know in his mind, he's probably thinking, I'm no good for ministry. I'm no good for Christ. He's, I'm no use to this, to this man. I'm done. I'm finished. The three years, waste. But that's, not what Peter, uh, that's not what Jesus does. He comes back, and he comes to Peter first. Compassion. And he says to him on the beach, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times to give Peter the same. Three times to read. Repent. And notice verse 6, the 500 witnesses, people will say, well, this was a massive hallucination that he didn't really appear to 500 people. Well, even if you had a, a smoke screen of some sort and you drugged everyone, they're not all going to see the same exact detail, hallucination, even if you could hallucinate all of everyone. Mm -hmm. I think the best one is uh, verse 7. 
James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't even believe in John 7, we, we see that John, James didn't even believe his own brother. He's a half-brother of Jesus. And yet later, he's leading the church in Jerusalem. What changed? I don't think it, the conversation had to be much. Last thing you saw was your brother died on the cross. 33 years. You know, you can hear the family talking. People do it all the time. Well, look at that. He told that boy to quit doing that. And he went ahead and got himself killed. And then you hear, James, it's me. Converted. <laughs> you know, Jesus standing at the door. This is the gospel that we preach. This is verse 11. This is what Peter and Paul are saying. This is, this is what we believe, that Jesus came back from the dead. And we're not going to really go through to try and prove it anymore. I'm not going to go through that litany of, of, there's a whole bunch of people that like to do that, but I'm really not a good apologist as far as that come, goes. And we notice in verse 12 to, to verse 9, Paul talks about what if, what if Christ is not resurrected? Now, we're not, like I said, we're not going to start defending all the points, but what, we're, what he's saying here, if Christ is not resurrected, verse 14, our time in the church, our faith in Christ is a waste of time. Verse 17, you're still in your sins. And 18, those people who have died believing in this Christ, if he didn't raise, if he didn't raise they're suffering in hell right now because their sins weren't paid for. And we are the saddest of all men, verse 19. Well, this brings us right to our second point. <clears throat> Paul demonstrates in verse 20 that Christ having died, like, likewise also, therefore he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Now here he starts to establish the order of the resurrection. He doesn't defend that it happened yes or no. Necessarily. He doesn't fight it on an apologetic level where he's going to dispute atheists. But he's just simply saying that it happens and here's the order. And he's going to show you how. And he's going to show you why. And you and I think it's going to make a lot of sense. It might be a little confusing right now, but I want you to follow through. This is going to be, I think it's going to have a great ending. If he's not raised, how will we enjoy the eternal kingdom with a dead king? 2 Peter, verse 11, is the entrance. He talks about the entrance into the eternal kingdom. So we're talking about the eternal kingdom. This is not a temporary, physical, earthly kingdom that was being talked about in the first century. John 6, 40, everyone who believes Jesus, it says, will raise. How can he raise someone from the dead if he himself hasn't been raised? Well, the answer is in Revelation 11. The seventh angel sounded, and there were a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Because he has been raised and he lives. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not become tired or weary. In John 1 in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in case you think, well, that could be talking about God the Father, look at verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. And just to be sure who He is, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And here in Corinthians, he says in verse 21, since he put on the flesh, for since by a man came death, a man by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So also this man came the resurrection of the dead, and Paul reiterates that in verse 22. And I didn't even open my own Bible, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Talk amongst yourselves for a second. <laughs> I'm kidding. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Yeah. But just as the God of order has an order for the creation, he has an order for the resurrection. Verse 23, Christ is the first fruits. Now, he's not literally the first person who was raised. We know that Elijah raised someone in the Old Testament, right? We know that Jesus himself raised Lazarus. 
So he's not the first, but he's the first of his kind. We know about this when we talk about the stories with our kids, with Noah, right? We know that every animal on the face of planet Earth didn't walk into the boat. It was two of its kind. We'll get to that in a little while. But farmers would check the first fruits of their crop to see how the crop, the harvest was going to come in that year. And Jesus is the first fruits of that crop. Because there is a common harvest. It's not here yet, but it will be. Follow me on this idea. In 1 Thessalonians, we all know about 1 Thessalonians 4 as being the end times, right? Talking about the Lord will descend with a shout. The voice of the trumpet of the archangel and the trumpet of God and then listen the dead in Christ so Christ is already dead and resurrected the dead in Christ will rise first so there's the second fruits right this is the, this is the harvest first Thessalonians 2 19 for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming that's us that's the believers so we're being raised and Paul spends verse 24 to 28 going through this eschatology, the real fancy word for the study of the end times. And it's kind of weird how verse 29 comes in because it almost seems like it comes out of nowhere. And it starts, and it looks at it, let's look at it for a second. Verse 29, otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Mormons have a different take on that. They think that means you can be baptized for your dead relatives. They think that you can be baptized and that your relatives who aren't Mormons will be raised to the celestial kingdom. I know this because I have Mormons that are relatives. They live out in California. There's nothing wrong in California. My brother lives there too, and he's a great guy. He's not a Mormon, by the way. Um, if you ever see this, Michael, you know I'm talking, I'm talking about you. Um, anyway, but we do have Mormons in the family, so I, I don't say these things lightly. I don't say it to make fun, to poke or insult people, but this is the truth. And they ask me about my, my family history that they're not really aware of. Maybe my family over in Ireland at my mom's side, not my dad's side. They're most of them on my dad's side over there. Nothing against my dad, but I'm going to get in trouble for this, I know. <laughs> anyway, uh... But they, they have this idea that you can be, okay, they can go to my, my grandfather Malvin, Malvern, and I can be raised, I can be baptized for Malvern, and Malvern will now find his way into the celestial kingdom. My grandmother Denise, his wife, will be, the person could be holding a little card, and will be baptized for Denise, and then she goes to the celestial kingdom. That's what they believe. That is not what this is saying. Verse 29 is not saying, it looks like it. If you look at the second half of that, why then are the are they baptized for them? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized for them? But that is not what this is saying. The whole entire time, Paul has been making the argument. I lost my page, my place. But he's making this argument so far that that it hasn't been. It's about if Christ hasn't been resurrected, as the, as the skeptics suggest. If Christ hasn't resurrected, he's saying, why are they being baptized in His name? That's the dead he's talking about, Christ. If he hasn't been resurrected, why are people being baptized in his name? Mm -hmm. They're wasting their time. He's saying the same exact thing the whole entire time. Nothing changed here in verse 29. But people like to do that. They like to take it out of context. But look at verse 32. He says, even if the dead aren't raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He's saying the same thing. If we're not raised, just live it up. Do what you got to do. Have fun. But that's not what's happening here. Verse 35, but someone will say, and Paul loves these theological or, or theoretical arguments, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they get? There's always some kind of joker that's going to have a mocking statement. So Paul, he gets on him. You fool in verse 36. That which you saw does not come, in li come to life unless it dies. And you're going to understand that in a second. It doesn't make sense right now. <laughs> And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. Might be a little confusing to you, but I think by the time I'm done with this, you're going to understand. The seed dies, and what we see growing was from the inside. When we dig down under a tree, we're not going to find a little seed in there. 
the shell of the seed is broken open and dies and it goes away. Right? It's what's inside that grows. And the final product, the tree, comes from what's inside the seed. Or the flower comes from what's inside the seed. The human comes from what's inside the seed. And the human, just like all the other ones, we all have the trees, the flowers, we all have the seeds. But in and of themselves, we don't bury a human to create another human. You don't bury a tree to get a tree. You bury the seed. The seed dies, the shell goes away. That's why Jesus was talking about in Matthew 13, 1 through 9, the parable of the soils. All have seeds. All trees have seeds. All flowers have seeds. But they don't all take, right? Mm -hmm. Some have rocky ground. Some lay down. Some take to the ground, but then they're choked out by the cares of life, right? Now, these are, understand, these are physical arguments talking about spiritual realities. He's making analogies here. And humans have a spiritual representation inside of them of the physical reality. It's our soul. The soul grows to its final product. You know what that is? It's an eternal body. Either the believer or the unbeliever grows to an eternal product. Either your body is going to be grown and you're going to have an eternal body made for destiny in heaven for all eternity. Or your body is going to grow a body that's resurrected and it can stand with the rigors of eternal hell. And this has been the overarching theme of this whole entire chapter and of what, the, what it means to resurrect it all. We are resurrected as believers to life. And I don't know if I said it before, this is the title of my message today. We're resurrected to life. I want to read you something I heard this week in my study by John MacArthur. And it, it's, a, it's a, just a quote right from his sermon. I kind of stole it. And they say not to use another preacher's illustrations, but I, just, I couldn't resist. This one's really good. Um, he's talking about our bodies aren't designed for eternity. Of course, we know that's what's being talked about here in Scripture. Our souls are, right? But our bodies are not. But listen to what John says here about the chemical makeup of the human body. And we're almost done. We're, this is going to be pretty short. The constituent parts of a man would be equal to about 1,200 eggs, protein. Iron enough to make two, two 10 penny nails, phosphorus enough to make 4,000 matches, fat enough to make 75 candles, give or take, I might make 80. <laughs> <laughs> One cake of soup, enough hydrogen to fill a balloon and put it up in the air, 60 spoonfuls of salt, a bowl of sugar, and about six gallons of water. Carl, uh, Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic said, enough lime to whitewash a chicken coop, magnesium enough to make a dose of magnesium, potassium enough to explode a toy cannon, sulfur enough to rid a flea of dogs, or a dog of fleas. <laughs> <laughs> you know I was gonna screw something up, right? <laughs> all that total value, 98 cents. Yeah. And all of it's rotting away, someday we're going to get a body that has no capacity to deteriorate, right? Incorruptible. Well, Paul says it like this in verse 50. We're, we're getting close. Now I say this, brethren, that the flesh and the blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And while Paul was mostly focused on um, those who have died in the faith in this chapter, he does have words of comfort for the believers who are still alive. Because he had the pressure on us right from the beginning, and we didn't really cover it a whole lot, but from the beginning he's been pressuring us to understand and know the true gospel. And he said to the Galatians, any other gospel is a false gospel. Any. Even if it's from an angel in heaven. We'll get on the Mormons again. Now I say this, um, Verse 51, let's look at that. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Remember we said, unbelievers and believers will go through this resurrection. 52, In the moment of the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and will be changed. He's not saying if the resurrection is true. He's saying it's happening. Whether you believe it or not, 
Whether you accept the gospel or not, it's coming. There's going to be a change for the unbeliever just as there's going to be a change for the believer. For the believer to life, the unbeliever to death. So just as the seed goes into the ground to produce the tree of the fruit, so too our physical bodies go into the ground. And when the time is right, we receive our, our eternal bodies and reunite with our souls. And that's the purpose of the trumpet, to mark the time. It's to mark God's time. And just as spring marks the new beginning in, on the earth, God marks the beginning for the believer and even to the unbeliever. We both receive our bodies crafted for their extended purposes. But Paul concludes in verse 55, O oh death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Because the sting of death is sin. Powered by the law and our inability to keep it. But thanks be to God, verse 57, right? Therefore remain steadfast, strong and unmovable, knowing that the work or toil that you do is not in vain because our faith is rooted in truth. Our faith is rooted in Jesus Christ. And it's this cry of every broken sinner that knows that when you're reaching out of the waters as you're drowning, you don't hold something in your hand. And we've talked about this many times in the last few weeks. Our good deeds, our good life, look, I'm not trying to say that your good deeds don't mean anything. But on a salvation level, they don't mean anything. I'm going to close by reading this poem by this Scottish preacher named Horatius Bonner. He wrote this in 1861. A little lengthy and a little wordy because he's Scottish. <laughs> and oh, I love Scots. I can hardly read what they say sometimes. Surely if there's such a thing could be, the best of sunlight fell on thee. The softest of the stars of night shed down on thee its sweetest light. Surely if such a thing could be, noon kept its gentlest rays for thee. The lightest of the winds of morn across the weary brow was born. The freshest dew that ever shed fell in its coolness on thy head. The fairest of the flowers that bloom reserved for thee their rich perfume. Yet though, this is the hard part, yet though this earth would, which thou hast made is best for thee mighty, mighty hourly spread. And though I, though if such a drink think might be, the best of sunlight fell on thee. Man had no love to give thee here, no words of peace, no look of cheer. No tenderness his heart could move, he gave thee hatred for thy love. The best of love was him to of, of him was given, the freest, truest grace of heaven. His worst of hatred fell on thee, his worst of scorn and enmity. Lift, lift us as is gifts for thy for him thy love brought in its fullness from above death of all deaths the sharpest he in his deep hate prepared for thee O love and hate thus face to face yea meet in this strange meeting place O sin and grace O death and life where who O oh, who shall conquer this strife father forgive his love's lone cry while hatred crowds shall crucify. How deeply man this God doth hate. I'm sorry. How deeply man his God doth hate. God's love to man, how true and great.